Welcome and aloha. I'm Mark Schlav, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea to Malaysia to meet Sitpa Selvaratnam. Sitpa is a Malaysia advocate. She is a lawyer with the law firm of Tommy Thomas in Kuala Lumpur. Sitpa zealously advocates for her clients. Sitpa also advocates for positive values that provide hope and encouragement to others. I've asked Sitpa to discuss her background, life and law, practice in Malaysia, and what fuels her advocacy. Welcome, Sitpa. It's good to see you. It's been a while since we've seen each other. How are you? Hello, Mark. I'm very well, thank you. And it's lovely to see you looking very well. I think it's been about two years since we last met, so it's such a pleasure. Thank you for having me on your show. Well, uh, yeah, let, let, let's get into it. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. What's your background? Where did you grow up? How did you get into law? How did you become a lawyer? Right. Um, well, once I was born in Malaysia, I've always lived in Malaysia, except for about five years that I was studying in the United Kingdom. Um, my ancestry goes back um, to Sri Lanka. So my, on my mother's side, my, um, my mother's grandfather parents uh, came to Malaysia in 1890s, more than 130 years ago. And um, it was then called, Sri Lanka was then called Ceylon. So they were from the Jeffna Peninsula in Ceylon. And the British, both uh, Ceylon and Malaysia, or Malaya, as it was then called, were British colonies. And so the British brought my grandparents over here. And traditionally, it used to be for positions like, you know, station master and so on. And then many of them would go back to Ceylon. But my parents decided to stay on after independence and take on Malaysian citizenship. And education was very, very important, still is, for the Jaffna Tamils in Malaysia, everywhere. In fact, Jaffna Tamils are everywhere. And so they put their four children, my parents, um, through um, tertiary education. But because Sri Lankan minority, uh, Sri Lankan Tamils are minorities in Malaysia, uh, and we've had uh, aff affirmative action in Malaysia um, towards the, the Malay race. It was not always easy to get university seats here in Malaysia. So all four of us siblings, we went abroad for our tertiary education. And I went to England, uh, Wales and West Cardiff, University of Wales, and then to Cambridge to do my law. But if you well, ask me why well, law? Yeah. Was why, that, why did you become, why, what prompted you? What motivated you to become an advocate? Right. So reading law was quite by accident. Uh, you see the Sri Lankan psyche or the Salonis psyche is you better be a professional so that you're independent. So you either had to be a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer or accountant. And by default, I didn't like the others. I said, all right, all right, I'll do law. But Mark, it was one of the two best decisions in my life. Reading law was fa fabulous. I realized it came naturally to me. And of course, the second decision was choosing my husband, Mohan, who you also know. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, that sounds like fun decisions. Uh, <laughs> now, what, what, tell me a little bit about your practice. What, uh, what type of practice do you have? What, what type of law do you advocate? Right, so I'm very lucky. I, um, I practice uh, exactly what I'm interested in and what I learned at university. So because I went to University of Wales Cardiff, uh, where maritime law was uh, the major attraction, we had Professor Ted Wallader teaching the course on faculty, and he was instrumental in promulgating the UNCLOS, the Convention on the Seas. And so I took maritime law at university, loved it, international trade, corporate insolvency in my master's. And so that's what I do. I practice maritime law, uh, international trade, commercial law, and corporate insolvency. And so and we is, have to all come together. And is that, I mean, is that admiralty law? Is that within? Admiralty law, here, yeah. absolutely. Ad and admiralty. Admiralty. I'm sorry? Yes, admiralty law and the wider net, which in, encompass, uh, encompasses international trade, commodity movements. Um, yes, all of that. 
And I guess Malaysia is, I mean, it's in the, in the, there's a lot of water around Malaysia, right? I mean, that may, yeah, it yeah. makes sense. So there must be a lot of different types of cases that you've handled. Absolutely. We, well, we've got a huge, long uh, uh, coastal line. Uh, and you must know that Malaysia, we've got two parts. It's the peninsula that is sandwiched mm -hmm. between Singapore and, Malaysia, uh, and Thailand. And then we've got the other part, uh, Saban Sarawak, two states uh, in the island of Borneo. And that's just surrounded by the South China Sea. So plenty of sea, plenty of active ports, a lot of commodity movements. So yes, um, maritime law is actually very critical, very essential for us. Right. I mean, your, your country is has the ocean between two major parts of it. And Absolutely. yeah, yeah, that's quite, quite interesting. Uh, in a way, Hawaii is similar. We're away from the main part of uh, the United States. Now, I, I notice uh, that you've had a lot of interesting cases. Uh, and I've, uh, you know, I, I've, I've seen one extraordinary case uh, that is very interesting to me. And I've just learned from you that you've written a book about it. It will come out in April, and it's about a super luxurious yacht called the Equanimity. And I, I, I looked up this yacht on the internet, and I mean, wow. I mean, it has a heliport. It has, it has uh, all sorts of, I mean, I think it has a hot tub and all, all different types of things within it. Now, what, what was this book about what, that, you, that you're writing? What, what, it, was, it was a case. It's based on a case, right? What is this all about? Mark, you've touched something that is closest to my heart. Um, it was the highest point uh, of my life and my career. So, but I, to narrate that story, I just need to tell you a little bit about Malaysia. Right, okay. so we became, we became independent from uh, British uh, rule in 1957. And for 61 years, we were governed by one ruling party. Yeah, and what happened was um, in 2018, we had a seismic shift in mindset because for after 61 years we had a change in government. Uh, the opposition finally uh, formed a coalition government um, in May of 2018. What was the catalyst for that change was the scandal, an international scandal called the 1MDB um, and it involved the, the worst case of uh, kleptocracy, as defined by the US DOJ, uh, involving our former prime minister, who was then subsequently charged and convicted um, of multiple breaches and uh, crimes. And in the center of that saga was money stolen, money in excess of 4.2 billion US dollars from the people taxpayers' money using 1MDB, which was a national wealth fund. And monies were siphoned off, stolen, embezzled. You can use any one of those uh, terms to describe it. And went everywhere, many, many places. But 260 million US dollars, US dollars and in millions, yes, was used to purchase this super yacht equanimity. And so as soon as we had this change in government, and this was the people, so you must understand how it felt after 61 years, when the people's will to have integrity and transparency and accountability brought back into government, when we had a new government, the first task was to actually clean it up, bring back money's lost, and therefore the economy, which was then um, in Indonesia, was somehow through diplomatic channel, uh, channels brought within waters of Malaysia. And so my skills match perfectly. I have been doing admiralty laws, maritime laws for many, many years, by then more than 25 years. And my uh, law practice partner was the attorney general of Malaysia at that point in time. So he approached me and said, well, how should we do this? And I said, admiralty laws, the best, most transparent way that will bring back credibility to the system, the best way to recover maximum amount uh, in recovery proceeds. And here we're looking to recover from the judicial sale um, hundreds of million. And so we put it engaged uh, a mark um, uh, processes of the Admiralty Law. It took us nine months. What would normally take a super yacht 18 to 24 months to sell in the average market? Because we're talking, you know, millions of dollars. You need uh, only about 100 or less individuals, uh, billionaires in the world have that kind of appetite. 
and, and they take a long time to make their decision. Uh, and what would normally take 18 to 24 months to sell, we sold in nine months. And in that process, and we covered 126 million US dollars for the people of Malaysia, for the, the government of Malaysia then. And so in that process, Mark, there, was, there were uh, huge lessons that I learned. And so I put that in a book um, and it is put in seven maritime lessons because the lessons from maritime, it just challenged the, the traditional wisdom, the tra traditional ways we used to do things from you know, keeping the appraised value confidential, how we sold it and many, many of those. So I put it in seven lessons. And then I have a last, a last lesson, which is called the plus one, which is the spiritual dimension, because I oh. learned so much about life in that nine months. And that's the, the space to watch for, for my uh, uh, seven maritime lessons and the values as well that came with that. And I, I wanna put back uh, on the screen, a picture of the uh, uh, book cover. Uh, take a look at that book cover, uh, and that's the that that's the equanimity right on there, right? That's that, that's a, a painting of the equanimity. Now, now, and so the, there was funds that were siphoned off from the people's government to buy that boat originally by someone, I guess, close to the government, and and then you were able to seize it. You were, the book is about the arrest of the, the yacht and sell it. And, and, and you were involved in that case. That was your case. That's right. I, I headed the team of lawyers for that arrest, saw her through the, 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 the really difficult management of a seven-star princess, you know, the most luxurious, most expensive, most delicate. So we saw the management of her and then actually had to go out there and find a buyer to recover uh, the Now, one thing you mentioned, you mentioned the Department of Justice, United States Department of Justice. How did, I mean, I, I'm glad to hear that the United States helped out somehow, but how, how, did they, how did the Department of Justice help out? How were they involved? Mark, I can't tell you how grateful I am to the US and specifically to the Department of Justice. So um, they commenced a forfeiture action through the kleptocracy department recovery of uh, um, assets department. And um, they did all the tracking for us, the trails. It went through 32 different accounts, in and out, mindless, meaningless flow of accounts um, to eventually get into the, the, the vessel, to the, the builder of the yacht. And we had to trace her through 32 accounts. But that was made only possible because the DOJ held that space for us when we couldn't do it ourselves. So they did it in 2016, 2017. Remember, we only changed our government in 2018. So we're tremendously grateful that the DOJ should have done it for someone else. It didn't matter to them. They were going to, uh, to seize assets and uh, repatriate it back to Malaysia. So how wonderful is that, that another country should have your back? And that was what it was. No. That, that is uh, actually very good to hear that uh, law can help out each other in different countries. I mean, that's actually very remarkable. Uh, I, I didn't know that story. And I, I'm looking forward to your book. It comes out in April. Is that right? It is coming out. In fact, this is the first uh, public um, speaking <laughs> of doing of the cover book. So thank you for this opportunity. Oh, well, good, good. I'm looking forward to your book. Um, now, I want to I want to go back a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in Malaysia. What what is going on? How have you dealt personally and professionally with the pandemic? How have things changed? What what's going on in Malaysia right now with respect to the pandemic and dealing with it? Okay, so Mark, we aren't in a terribly good place. Obviously, the world isn't because of the pandemic. Um, and I mentioned to you that we had a wonderful um, shift in government. Uh, the majority willed it in 2018. But unfortunately, last year in February 2020, just as COVID was about to rage around the world in February, we had a change in government. And it was not through um, the people's vote or elections. It was just a political maneuver. So it has been a dip, uh, but we remain hopeful. Things can change. Uh, hope's always the, the, the way forward. Uh, but 
So the new government came in. Uh, they managed it pretty well with our uh, Ministry of Health. We had movement control uh, orders in place. We still have in varying degrees. So we, our borders are closed. International borders are closed unless you really have a reason to travel. Like my daughter had to travel back to, to study medicine in UK. She could travel back, but I, I can't go to visit her. So there are restrictions on, on movement control. Even with, within states in Malaysia, it's off and on. When the, the numbers spike, we can't move. Um, but since June, um, lawyers have been considered essential service. So we can return to office, uh, but most of our hearings are done remotely, either you know on a Zoom platform like this um, or in some other e-platform. Witnesses are heard remote as well if it's urgent. So we've had access to justice despite the terrible pandemic. So um, everything's not lost. We've had to learn a lot of new things. Uh, obviously, it's made this possible, Mark. I would never have thought of doing this session with you. Um, and so it's made um, uh, global accessibility possible. Um, but we've also un uh, uncovered rather um, not so uh, pleasant environments where we've seen uh, uh, foreign labors yeah. being put through terrible, horrific um, conditions of uh, living. But luckily, that's the silver lining, if you may, if you may call it that, because of the clusters of COVID that broke in that inhumane condition, the, the way they were oppressed has come to light and hopefully that can be redressed. So it's been a mi mixture of good and bad, Mark, but we've, we manage, we always manage, we always thrive, we always survive. Well, that, that's interesting. Uh, it's a good insight about Malaysia uh, for uh, us here in the United States to hear these things. I also noticed, uh, and I mentioned that you were an advocate for uh, for hopeful things. And I watched a program uh, sponsored by an organization called TEDx, in which you talked about peaceful courage, and I'll, I'll put in quotes, peaceful courage. Uh, what, what is peaceful courage? What, what is that program about? What is TEDx? What, what are your involvement as an advocate in that area about? Right. So that program that you saw, I, I just was a guest speaker. Everyone knows TED, um, TED Talks, um, and, and that's for in spreading good ideas, inspirational talks about life. And the TEDx is the, the international version of it. It goes into communities and communities all around the world can post whatever they want, whatever they think is inspiring to that community. So it's an, a multiplier effect. Now, the program you saw was actually the TEDx Youth organized by school children, high school children, and they invited me to come and speak. So why did I choose Peaceful Courage? It's, it's, it's a point of passion for me. Courage is, courage, integrity, and, 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 and joy is. These are you know, um, things that I think about a lot. And so when the, this children group of, of youth came to me, I thought, well, I'm addressing a group of 18 to, uh, sorry, 13 to 18. What should I talk about? So again, I go back to the context in Malaysia. If I can generalize, we're a collective society rather than individual societies, meaning we tend to subordinate our individual rights and freedoms for the higher good of community. And that's because we're taught to do that, you know. And so it becomes like a, a demand for compliance. And in that process, there's a lot of inhibitions to voicing opinions about dissenting. And so indoctrinations happen. Bullying happens, abuse happens. And of course, that can, you know, can extrapolate it to drug addiction and all sorts of things. So I thought, let me speak to these children about courage, courage to actually speak your views, not to just blindly follow, but think, should I agree? Should I not? And to do it peacefully, meaning without anger, without resentment. And how does one do that? And, and so it was that I, I, I put in place what I do. Uh, in my advocacy, how I find peaceful courage, and I put it in a systematic way for them. You can only ev evoke peaceful courage, as I call it, if you go into a place that is happy and peaceful inside of you. And so that's a step to doing that, and then working from that platform. So that was, in a nutshell, what I tried to do in that 18-minute program of the TEDx Youth Mark. And I think we have a screenshot of the... Uh... Uh, program peaceful courage. There you are, and and your your audience was youth. I see. I, I liked it. I, I'm not that young, 
Well, I enjoyed your program uh, and and thought it was very nice. And you were I I could you know I I could sense that you were trying to communicate in a way um, a subtle way to uh, youth, and so that they could see it's okay, it's okay to be strong, it's okay. And in in Malaysian society, is that a good? I mean, is that is that a value you're trying to get across? Is that is that what you felt was important for the the youngsters, and is that something that there is a good reception for? Absolutely, Mark. I think we are beginning to liberalize the thinking. So for a long, long time, we have a herd mentality. It's a top down. I say it's good for you, whether it's your parent, your grandparent, your your religious teacher, schools, whatever. I say it's good. Don't ask questions. Just do it. But of course, with this generation of uh, youth, you can't do that anymore. They're exposed to worldviews and they are questioning all the time. And I'm just trying to encourage them to think that way. Yes, do question, but do it peacefully. Don't be. Don't you? Don't have to be a rebel. You don't have to throw chairs and a tantrum to be heard. That's another way of getting there. Be sure in yourself what your value is, what it is that's important to you. And then you are able to articulate in a manner that the other person is able to receive, whether it's a politician, whether it's your headmaster, whether it's your boss, uh, whether it's your peer, whether it's a group that you're heading. But it, it, the same principle cuts across all of these different se segments of society. And, and are you, I mean, you were addressing Malaysian youth in Malaysia society, but do you, is this more of a is this a, a a worldwide idea a worldwide thought that you think about i mean is this a major problem that we're facing across the world today or I mean, what are the major problems perhaps i should ask that are, are are we you know is this you know you talked about youth and i guess all young people now have technology a little more than we did or than i did uh, and, and so are you talking about a universal theme here? I guess that's what I, my question. Absolutely. It is universal. And I think it's time and it's already happening that we all embrace it. And we will. We will. It's a matter of timing, matter of degree. But it is something that applies across cultures, across borders. And that is to decide whether we want to allow the mistrust. So you ask, what is the major problem? I think there's a feeling of lack of safety. We all feel unsafe. Every one of us feels unsafe in different degrees because there is a lack of trust in the system, whether it's politicians, whether it's institutions, it's corporations, it's the judiciary, whatever the system is, there is still a reticence now that never, I think, existed for the last 50 years to this degree about whether they're batting for us, whether they have our backs the way the DOJ had a whack, are they all having this? Um, even my own, even our own. And so when you are in a place of mistrust, then there is fear that's induced because I don't know if I am safe. And when we are feeling unsafe, Mark, the best, the best way to defend is to attack. And that's when the bodyguard of our individual bodyguard, which is anger, comes to the fore and then comes out as hate speeches, anger, destructive. You listen to me, I'm right. And so anger then degenerates and everybody is in the position of defending their own turf. So that actually is the problem as I see it worldwide, everywhere. Uh, and what really this anger is trying to shield is a vulnerable individual inside who's feeling unsafe. And beneath that vulnerable individual is a fully joyful being. That's all of us. Our natural being, Mark, is to be joyous and laughter and, and happiness. And when we're happy and joyful, we are expensive, right? At some point, we're all going to tire of being angry and we're looking for models. And that's when it's impor important that we have models who show what it is to have the power of joy and then peaceful courage that comes from joy. And, and you know, you bring up a lot of thoughts that, uh, about, you know, the Inter-Pacific Bar Association, which we're both members, brings everybody together, which is a good, a good thing. And that, I, 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 is, I, I think that's what you're saying. I mean, what, what that, I mean you're, you're talking about a un universal issues that are facing us. 
what values do you feel are important for the future of Malaysia and the world in that respect? I mean, how, how do we get to that point? I mean, how do we get to that point of joy or how do we get to that point of just being able to be with one another without anger? Right. Um, so the anger is at a mind level. We've got to stop being at the mind level and move to the heart level, and we will. Once we get tired of the anxiety, get tired of the emotional roller coaster, we're going to find somewhere where we can be peaceful. And just having unified activities that brings about a sense of well-being will take us to that place. Uh, like you said, like the Inter-Pacific Bar, we come together for what is common. Laughter is common. Food is common. Joy <laughs> is common. And when you bring that together in that environment, you are united. And in unity, you break down your barriers and realize that joy and laughter and unity is more powerful than fear and decisive, divisiveness. And when we realize that, we move forward. Actually, that's nothing wrong with individuals. It's the politicians that play it up <laughs> for us. Yeah. So well, if we could gather more as individuals to form clusters of unified um, activities, enjoy, we would be able to move forward. And so it sounds like you have some hope for the future. Uh, uh, and right, is you have some hope. Plenty of hope. You see, the equanimity uh, taught me that. We were at the rock bottom of helplessness and hopelessness and things just changed. I didn't know that 52% people felt the way I felt. And just knowing that you want a particular thing, you have a vision for integrity and virtue and, and righteousness and, and not righteousness in the prim and proper, but for, for right um, action, transparency and accountability. And just holding that and vibrating. We have to vibrate at a high frequency. We are more influential when we do that. And so if we can get back to that hope, hold that vision, believe that we are causing, a, creating a ripple effect, it will take shape and form. Well, look, we have a minute left. Uh, I'd like to ask you, what advice would you give young lawyers who are just beginning their professional careers about how to live in this post-COVID new normal world? I think the most important to be happy, to find a true place inside you that's happy. So keep fit, keep mentally happy, keep you know, um, yourself happy. And when you're vibrating with happiness, you will get all the answers you need from the wisdom. It's like, you know, your internet cloud out there. There is a wisdom cloud out there that you would down download to address every, every problem that you have, to, to, challenge, to, to get answers to every challenge that you have. So just keep in a high vibration of happiness. That would be what I say. And I've got a second book that's coming out that will give you a, actually the, the roadmap to that eventually at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the year, Mark. Yeah. And oh, okay. I'm sorry, what, what is that one going to be called? It's called Resolved. How to be a fiery lawyer without violating your integrity and personality. And that's uh, Watch the Space at the end of the year. Well, uh, so, uh, I'm sorry? That's really catered for young lawyers and anyone wanting to do it differently. Okay. Well, Sipa, thank you for telling us about your life as an advocate, not just in law, but in life uh, and, and what to look forward to. And we look forward to your books. So aloha, as we say in Hawaii, thank you very much for being my guest today. And uh, I hope that uh, we'll see each other in person sometime in the future. It's been such a pleasure and honor. Thank you for having me, Mark. And we will meet soon. <laughs> All right. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.